come to, in our parables, the publican and the Pharisee. Now this is a great little parable. It's a wonderful little parable. Now, as I pointed out in several of the parables that I've, I've chosen for this class, I started out with parables that Jesus told us exactly what the parable was about. That way we don't have to worry, we don't have to wonder, we know. Jesus explains it all to us. He does that with a couple of his parables. Now, Jesus does not explain this particular parable, although even without an explanation, I think, <laughs> I think the message is pretty plain what's going on. But Luke, let's look at, you're just going to have to follow along in your Bibles. Like, I'll, I'll, do what, I'll do what our good brother David does over here. I'll say, everybody hold up their Bibles. We're going to follow along in the Bible. Nothing fancy. All right. The key verse here, I think, is your Luke 18, 9. Oh, it's just not going to work. Why aren't you working? Oh, well. Yeah. Luke 18, 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So Luke... In his retelling of this, Luke explains to us, here's what this parable is about. This parable is about a group of individuals that trust in their own righteousness and despise others. Pretty simple. And then Jesus spake this parable. This is Luke 18, 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves and that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went into the temple to pray. Wait for it. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Now, in this instance, it's now become our job to figure out who is the one that is self-righteous and despises others. That's our job from this point on. We've got to figure this out and identify who is involved in this. So I'm going to take a little time to read through this entire parable. Two men went into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So there you go. There's our parable. Now it's our job. Let's take this apart, and we're going to figure out who was the self-righteous one in that little in that in that story there. First off, we have one a Pharisee. Now the Pharisees are an interesting bunch of fellows. Pharisees were strong Jewish nationalists, and they viewed themselves as the true protectors of Jewish identity and culture. They stood up against the hated Romans. They were celebrated. They were leaders of their community. They were people of prominence and import. When you wanted to decide something important, you would go talk to a Pharisee. When you wanted to decide something about tradition, you went to talk to a Pharisee. You didn't make a business decision, a major social decision. You might not even decide who you were going to have your daughter marry or your, or your, or your son marry. You went and discussed it with a Pharisee. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Don't stone me. But in secular history... The Pharisees are almost universally admired. They are almost universally looked upon as something of standing towers, paragons of virtue, righteousness, and correct living. Not quite what we get in the scriptures, now is it? 
I will tell you something else. They were very legalistic. They were separatist. They believed in separating themselves from any that were not Jews, separating themselves from the nation of the Gentiles. And let's face it, the Romans did not have a reputation of being righteous, ethical, good people. I mean, read some of the stories of Caligula. Read some of the stories of their conquest and how they carried out. Read about their idolatry and their paganism. Read about all of the excesses. There was one of the books that I was reading one time, and it, had a, it was a history written by a, a poet by the name of Juvenal is his name. He's an interesting fellow. And his stuff gets pretty, I mean, it gets pretty X-rated, I'll just tell you. As a matter of fact, in this book, this man was describing some of the excesses of uh, Claudius. And the, they stopped, and they, the, the, the translators actually had a section where they said, we can't translate this. If we translate this, this book will no longer be able to be sold to general audiences. What was being described and talked about was that bad. Why don't you think about that? That's who these Pharisees were standing up against. That's who these Pharisees were protecting the people of Israel from. Sounds like a pretty nice bunch of people, wouldn't you say? Now, as I said before, they're legalistic. And to help people out, to help people obey the Old Testament law, the Pharisees added something like 248 extra commandments. And some 365 prohibitions added to God's law to build a hedge, to build a wall of protection, if you would. Now, this was done over, I don't know, a couple of, I mean, a hundred year period. Numerous rabbis, you've got, <laughs> now, if y'all have taken a look down the library, you've got all these, we've got all of our, uh, whatchamacallit, your commentaries, right? You've got your Kaufmans, you've got your, Abner's, you got your Robert's words, you got your Strong's, whatever. They had, I mean, stacks of these things. If you were to give them some connection to today, you would call them maybe conservatives, politically conservative. I mean, that's, I'm stretching it. Just, I'm trying to find just a, a nebulous, a, a tenuous connection. Fundamentalist. Religious influencers. I could see a, a Pharisee having a blog or being a religious influencer on the internet. I could see that. Oh, look at this. Wow. I'm working now. Hold on. Let's see if I can catch up with Ryan. Oh, here we go. Look at that. I love technology. <laughs> anyway. Now, my personal favorite of the commandments that they added so on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to do any work, right? We know this. This is Old Testament law. Well, the Pharisees said, oh, that's a little dangerous. Somebody could make a mistake there, so we need to add something to that. So what they did was, is they said it was also wrong for a woman to look into a mirror on the Sabbath. You know why? I love this. Say it again, Carol. They might do something to fix their parents. See how concerned the Pharisees were for the welfare of their fellow Jews. Just think of that. So concerned that they take that concern and they're going to add those laws to help protect you. Don't look in a mirror because you might be, you might be tempted to fix your parents. Let's take a look at his prayer. Notice the focus of his prayer in the audience. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Now, this phrase, the King James does it this way. Some of the other translations will say it, the Pharisee stood by himself. That's not quite what this says. I'm not going to tempt the Greek. I've mentioned it before. I'm not good with Greek, but I am really good at cross-referencing and using the Strong's. This is saying the Pharisee stood 
and had a soliloquy with himself. Not only that, this has the idea... <sighs> he struck a pose. Or maybe this, I don't you know, maybe he struck a pose. He had an appearance. He wanted people to know, I'm praying. And his audience, as with any soliloquy, was himself. He was talking to himself. That's what this, the, the, the Greek here implies that the man wasn't just standing alone. He was talking to himself. He was having a conversation with himself. And notice what he says. The Pharisee stood by and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Wasn't he? That's five eyes. He's got two, he's got three eyes in one sentence. I have a tendency, and my son sometimes accuses me of being a bit judgmental about these things, and maybe I am. I have a tendency when someone uses I a lot, especially a politician or someone like that, or some business leader, when they use I a lot, I tend to tune them out. Because, I, you know, they're just talking about themselves. And he's quite proud of himself. Now let's notice some more about this. I want you to notice who this paragon of justice and rightness and right living. Notice some things. I thank thee that I am not as other men are. He holds his fellow man. He holds his fellow humans in contempt. And he is obviously superior to them. Now, my mom gets on to me when I do this. She's going she's gonna to fuss at me. She probably doesn't remember this. I remember this. I got into trouble with my mom one time. What had I done? Oh, I had gotten into something I wasn't supposed to get into. She got mad at me and got on to me. And I looked at her. I kid you not. I looked at her square in the eyes and I said, well, at least I'm not a drug user. I was about 10 years old. What does that have to do with anything? That's what he does. Did you notice it? This is childish. This isn't an adult. This isn't adult thinking. This isn't mature thinking. This is the thinking of a child. God, I'm good. Notice I'm not, I'm not an adulterer like these other people. I'm not, a, I'm not a horrible individual. I'm not a liar. I'm not a murderer. Well, good for you. You're following the basic tenets of the law. Well done. I think Jesus had someone that approached him that said something similar. And when it came down to the nub, that man wasn't ready to follow Jesus, was he? Now, this was not an uncommon attitude amongst the religious elite of the time. We see this attitude among other Pharisees, the lawyers, even the Sadducees for that matter. We'll talk about them next class. I like the Sadducees. Well, not really, but I mean, they're, they're an interesting bunch. Then drew near unto, remember, now we remember this from Luke 15 from our discussion before, the lost coin, the lost sheep, all that, right? Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, what? This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. You can just hear the contempt coming off of them. Let's look at more. Let's take a look at this. I fast twice a week. Now, the Old Testament law requires you to fast once. That's the Day of Atonement. Now, you can fast at other times, and fasting is often used as a way you would fast before you made an important decision. You would fast as a way of showing uh, contrition. I mean, you would fast to show a lot of things. One thing you would fast, and we see this often in the Scriptures, of someone is fasting to show repentance, sorrow, is that why he's fasting? I don't think so, because I didn't hear any line where he identified any sort of sin in his life. I give tithes of all that I get. Under Old Testament law, you're really only required to give tithes of, from the fields and the cattle. Now what he's saying is, is I give from the things that I bought. 
Like I've gone to the store and I bought, or the, well, not the store, I've gone to the marketplace. And I bought some things and now I'm giving tithes of those. This kind of attitude, this kind of approach is quite typical of the Pharisees' approach to improving and protecting God's law. Let's take a few steps on this. Here's what God's Son tells us about those people that are improving and protecting God's Word. This section, Matthew 23, is often called the seven woes of the Pharisees. This is Jesus speaking, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whosoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works. For they say and do not, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Skip on down. But all the works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries. These were prayer dooly doos that they put. Like I've got a, a popular scripture, like a little, looks like a little box. They would take it and wrap it around the back of their heads. The Romans, several of the Roman writers found that actually particularly humorous, honestly. You, <laughs> they, they made fun of that viciously. I'm not making fun of it, but what I am talking, pointing towards you, the purpose of that was not to help me remember that, and Jesus calls them on it. It was to be seen. Of their garments and love the uttermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Teacher, master. Let's skip, ma'am. Is there anything in the Old Testament law that gives the need for phylacteries? You have a reference to it. Um, Moses talks about it having that the, the the God's law before you on your post and that kind of thing, but it's not. Yeah, it's not a yeah, it's not a requirement. I mean, it, I, I often hesitate to make to. But have y'all ever played that card game where you've got the card on your head? I mean, that's what it reminds me of. Because that's not going to help you, Brother Light. I can't remember the scripture, but I don't know how to explain it to you now. But there is one where it talks about scripture prophets on your forehead. That's where we get that. Yeah. The issue, yeah, the frontlet being that I, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling my brain up on that. If somebody's got a great concordance, look that up. It's, it's actually kind of a good little verse. But I think you hit it. It's more, it's more of a, um, yeah, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6 and 8. Yeah. And so there's not anything particularly wrong here, but the issue comes in is why am I doing this? Am I doing it to keep God's word in front of me so that I can read it and know it and, and show it its proper respect? Or am I doing it to be seen of men? And Jesus identifies that this is being done to be seen of men. And then you skip on down and call no man your father upon the earth for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself there, he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And then notice our last one here. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you paid tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Sound familiar as to what our Pharisee is praying about and letting God know that he does? And have admitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not leave the others undone. Ye blind guides which strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. I have indulged, I must admit, in a bit of sarcasm 
I do apologize. No, I don't apologize. It. I, I, I'm often sarcastic, but it is obvious that this Pharisee and the Pharisees as a whole were not a force for good. They appeared to be. They appeared to be men that sought something, but they all suffered. They were the ones that refused to acknowledge Christ. They were the ones that led others away from Christ. And this particular Pharisee suffers from the sin of pride. And pride is incredibly dangerous. He didn't thank God for all that he had. He didn't pray for his fellow man. He seemed he held them in contempt. He did not acknowledge that he was a sinner. He did not ask God to forgive his sins. He did not ask God for anything because he was already perfect in every way possible and told God so. His thoughts were on himself and his own superiority to all others. He prayed to an audience of one himself. He asked for nothing. He gave thanks for nothing. And he received exactly what his just dessert was. Absolutely nothing. Pride, I'll say it again because it is worth saying, is dangerous. Overreening, overpreening pride, pridefulness. Now, I'm not talking about taking pride in your work. I'm not talking about taking pride in a good day's work or doing well at something. I'm talking about the kind of pride that we see in this Pharisee. Blinds us to our true condition. Blinds us to the answer of our sins. Blinds us to our own faults. But we can see with piercing accuracy the faults of everybody else. It blinds us to our need for a Savior. It blinds us to what, let's call it what it is. Let's call pride what it is. Let's call self-righteousness what it is. It is idolatry. That's exactly what it is. This kind of pride is idolatry. Self-righteousness equals self-worship. a hard thing to swallow isn't it that's what it is and that's what this pharisee is doing his pride blinds him to the condition that he's in and it blinds him to the danger that he's in and it blinded them to the christ it blinded them to the promise they couldn't see it because of that now come to the publican now here is where context comes in important if you were telling a parable in this day and age guess who the hero of the parable ought to have been the pharisee here's why the publicans these were jews this is a jew he's a jew that collected taxes for the romans Now, the Romans had this sort of farming tax system. So what you did was you would go to Carol's house. Now, see, I would would bid for this, right? I'm just going to use, I'm going to 100, 100, I'm going to say I've got to collect 10,000 drachma, whatever. So I go to Carol's house. Now, how do I make my money? How do I get my salary? Because the Romans don't pay you a salary. How do you make your salary? Well, maybe. I mean, maybe I'm collecting more than I'm supposed to. I mean, that's what happened. But I mean, I'm setting that low, right? 10,000 drachma out of the whole area of Palestine. That's, I don't know. I don't have a clue. But you're right. It's whatever you collected above that amount. That's what your salary was. Now, what is that usually going to lead people to do? I mean, I'm going to... When I go to your house, (laughs) wow, Carol, let's look at all of this stuff that you've got here. And then I'm going to go over to your all's house and I'm going to say, well, now your husband works at a bank, doesn't he? Yeah, that's a, he makes a lot of money. And you look at her, she's saying, no, I know he makes a lot of money. So we're going to charge you more. Now, Miss Barnwell, I know you've got a lot of money. You're a teacher. You teachers get a lot, get paid tons. Cindy, you're in that group too. I'm coming. I've seen your all's house. It's a nice house interesting 
this system was used in a lot of places. The Persians had a tendency to have really drab. Like, have you ever seen like the Persian houses where they got those beautiful little, like the older one they, in archaeology, they've got these beautiful uh, inner courtyards. Do you know why? Because the outside of the house was made to look ugly to avoid the tax man coming around. I'm actually reminded of a song, the Beatles. The Beatles have a song called The Tax Man. Y'all listen to that. I'm the tax man, and it goes through all the things, you know, if you're walking down the street, I'm going to tax your feet. If you're driving a car, I'm going to tax the street. If you're about to die, you better declare the two coins on your eyes. I mean, I'm the tax man. If, you, if I give you 5% and you think that's not enough, be glad I didn't take it all. Well, that was the Romans tax farm system. I mean, it was almost as if you designed a system for corruption and graft. And these men worked, not only were they tax people. I mean, even today, we don't like tax men, do we? I mean, we fought a whole war over this, did we not? This thing called a revolutionary war. But tax, I think there's something in there, J.C. Davis, something about taxation without representation, a couple little ideas along those lines. Tyranny, yes, we called it tyranny. And we were so upset about it, we were more than happy to go to war over it. Now, they taxed. Sugar, paper, stamps? Yes. Yeah. So back in Georgia on the plantations, they were taxing for the doors. And he had a door that was, if you've ever seen some of the old, old ones, they've got a door that goes all the way back, so you really only tax for one. But the windows are really low. So if you want to get out, you just raise up the window and step out. But that's not a door. You've had other places in Europe. There was a country in Europe a long, long time ago. This is the medieval times where they taxed windows. So what did people do? They, so no one likes a tax man. But not only this, let's imagine that you have a tax man I don't know, let's say Russia. Let's say Russia somehow manages to invade and take over our country. And then they impose a tax system on us. And you, you decide J.C. Davis becomes one, maybe Brian becomes one. L.A., Mr. Fox over there becomes one. He's a tax agent for the Russians. He's a fellow citizen that is taking taxes from you. How do you think you would feel about that individual? Would you feel warm and fuzzy towards them? I don't think so. They tarred and feathered tax collectors in the, in, in the early parts of the American Revolution. If you know, I won't go into details about that, but that was not a pleasant experience. Try third degree burns all over your body, see how you feel after that. That's what they did to tax collectors. That's who this man is. He's a tax collector. Likely corrupt, because most of them were. Certainly working for the enemy. And working for the very group of people that the Pharisees are trying to protect the Jews against. In a parable, this would have been the enemy. But he's not here, is he? Notice this poor man. Standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. Here is the very picture of a man that is penitent. Someone painfully and profoundly aware of his sinful condition. Smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now the Greek there is, he's doing, oh, don't want to do that because I'll, that won't be, that'll be, un, anyway. He's smoting on his breast the entire time he's doing this. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Again, our English translations kind of miss this point. As I said before, the Pharisee has struck a pose. He struck a praying pose. Whereas this man is just, I mean, he's hunched over. He's not even standing up. He can't even look up. This is the sign of humility. 
He didn't compare himself to his fellow man, but compared himself to the standard set by the Old Testament law. Now this becomes important here in a little bit. Doesn't justify himself, doesn't argue his case. He didn't blame the Pharisee. He didn't compare himself to the Pharisee. He owned his condition. He owned his sin. And I want you to notice the Pharisee, depending upon the translation that you use, the Pharisee's prayer is about 35 words, give or take. This man says eight. I've prayed a shorter prayer. You all have heard me probably say this before. But when my youngest was born, she was born with a cord wrapped around her neck. I prayed. I don't have a clue what I prayed. I'll never, I never will. But it was probably the most profound prayer I've ever said, I've ever said in my life. I want you to also notice, most important of all, he spoke to God. His audience was God. His audience wasn't himself. And again, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. I'm not, this is not me doing a screed against uh, public prayer. Because the public, depending upon the public prayer. But this wasn't a politician's prayer. This wasn't some prayer where they're praying to the audience. He prayed to God. That's who he prayed to. And I don't have to guess about the outcome of all this. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. To be justified means just as if one had not done the thing. Now, I add this little part in here. This man was a Jew. And what we're talking about justified under the Old Testament law. Now, I say that because I got into a fairly brisk argument with a gentleman one time who used this parable to talk about the sinner's prayer. He, he talked about, of course, you have the thief on the cross is one that, they, that, that is often talked. And I'd never actually heard someone use this parable this way. But he said, I want to say the publican's prayer that I'm justified by just this prayer. Well, a couple problems there. It's why I'm taking the time to point this out. Because at the time they were under the Jewish law. Jesus had not died yet. The, the, the law had not been nailed to the cross. Jesus is talking about them of a justification under the Old Testament law. And that's what's referenced here. Now, the application for us is obvious, is it not? If we're going to pray, we cannot pry. Bleh. If we're going to pray, we cannot pray in this prideful way that the Pharisee did. Our prayers have to be, must be, should be humble. Comment? No. Notice James, James 4, 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. James 4, 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And Brian, I'm going to borrow from your Proverbs class, because we got two good Proverbs for this too. Well, there's actually a bunch of, there's a bunch of Proverbs for this, but I like these two. Better it is to be in a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoils with the proud. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. This, I cannot emphasize enough to you that the audience hearing this would have had a very visceral reaction to this. To talk, about a rep to talk about a publican, a Roman tax collector, as being justified before God. I mean, not only just the Pharisees dislike these men, the Jewish people in general dislike them. 
I mean, just like we not particularly fond of taxes, our, I mean, in general. But these are occupiers. These are collaborators. I mean, this is on the level of people that collaborated with the Nazis when they invaded into country. This is on the level of people that collaborated with the Russians in East Germany, the secret police, the Gestapo, the, uh, all of these organizations. This is on that level of co co bleh, I cannot speak. This is on that level. This audience would have listened to this and keep in mind, as I pointed out, these Pharisees were universally praised, universally thought highly of. In A.D. 70, the Jewish nation ceased to be. It was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple destroyed and burned down. Some secular history shares that even the flagstones themselves were pulled up to get at the gold that had melted. When Arabs arrived in that area later on, all they found was a Roman temple to some Roman pagan god. Supposedly, all you've got left is this little section. They often call it the Weeping Wall. That's apparently the only, supposedly, the only original piece. And that wouldn't have been actually from the original temple. That would have been from the temple that Herod built. There's nothing. Do you know who held the Jewish nation, the Jewish identity, the Jewish culture together after that? It's the Pharisees. That's most rabbi traditions, rabbinic traditions today are Pharisee. But that's not who the hero of the story is. It is the man that showed humility. And the danger for us... Go ahead, Brian. Okay. The danger for us is to get caught in that Pharisee thinking of pride and legalism and adding to God's Word, making it better with our own human thoughts, our own human insights, our own human thinking about how this ought to work. Jesus called them out for that. And we have to avoid that trap because once you're caught in that trap, you're blind. Go ahead, Brian. In fact, Proverbs 1, verse 16, 18, talks about how pride is the trouble of the corruption and a haughty spirit of what's called. So many of that was Philippians 2. It teaches uh, all the way through this chapter. Brian is bringing up the proverb right before this, is where we get, you know, pride goeth before a fall. And then Philippians 2 talks about pride, not pride, humility. In detail. And I Brian, I'm going to paraphrase, says that the church is a hospital. It's for the sick. And we need to be very careful that we're not turning away people that we feel are unworthy. I had a man who wanted to be baptized. And he was a smoker. Been a smoker his whole life. I don't know if any of you all have ever been a smoker before. I fortunately have not. But my father has, and I've known a few smokers in my life. It is one of the hardest addictions to get off of. It's really hard. This man told me, he said, I want to be baptized. I said, great, let's go right now. We, I mean, I talked to him, so I knew he'd understood. I mean, I knew he'd understood all of this. 
And he stops me. He says, but I got to stop my smoking first. I said, hold up there. I think you've got the cart before the horse. That's not what it's all about. You're not supposed to be perfect before you get baptized. That perfecting of our life, that completeness comes after. Go ahead. Yeah. He said, amen. Everybody say amen, because that what he just said needs to be amen. The danger, we don't have to understand everything for us to be saved, for us to be baptized. What we do need to know is that we are in need of salvation, that we are in need of a Savior. And the rest comes with training and teaching afterwards. Bell is rung. You got the last comment, brother. I'm going to summarize, read James, read Romans. He talks about this, but the important thing for our prayer is to have the right attitude when we're praying. Now, on the board, we've got the conundrum of the woman with the seven husbands. Now, this is not a parable. It is one of the gotcha questions that the Sadducees asked Jesus. The reason I want to deal with this one and look at it because it gives us some insight in how Jesus takes apart something that is presented as a really impossible, difficult question. And it kind of sort of is a parable from the Sadducees. They're using a story to kind of catch Jesus. And I want us to look at how Jesus takes that apart and just starts from one step down the other. He just one, two, three, four, five, takes it apart. And I want us to have that learning and that looking at that, to have that kind of confidence when we're dealing with God's word. And besides, it's kind of a, it's kind of a neat little, it's a, it's a neat little, it's a neat little thing too. So read these, read all three of them and you'll be ahead of the game. Thank you guys. I appreciate your time and attention.